firstly, I actually couldn't believe it. No, it was amazing. It was an unbelievable feeling. Um, to be honest, I haven't expected it. I love to grow, so and I really want to grow. So I think it's a really good opportunity for me. Today on Dirty Linen, we are talking to a rising star of the Australian culinary landscape. Earlier this week in Sydney, there was the finals for the San Pellegrino Young Chef Academy Awards or the competition. Um, and the regional winner was Robin Wagner, who is a chef at McGill Estate in South Australia. Robin, congratulations. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it was. I was lucky enough to be at the San Pellegrino Awards. I got to see you cook and I emceed the gala dinner. And honestly, it was such an enriching and thrilling day. But doesn't matter what I thought about it. Tell us about it from your point of view. Um, from my point of view, uh, firstly, I think it wasn't even a competition for me, my feeling. It was more like a community. So all the other competitors... Um, yeah, straight from the beginning, we had all different kind of dishes. So no one had something similar at all. So everyone was unique and tried to deliver its own way. And then on the other hand, we were spending quite a bit of time. If you think from that kind of perspective that we actually would compete, um, we changed already ideas. We made connection pretty much um, yeah, I'm still with some of the guys in contact for catching up when they're coming down to Adelaide or when I'm flying up to Sydney or Melbourne. So it's just, it's really interesting and I really like that it didn't turn out pretty much like a competition. I just like the connection which we had all together because there were 10 great chefs and we're all having, yeah, we're all having our history behind it and stuff. So it was really, really interesting there. Yeah, I think that's so true. You def definitely, I agree that all the dishes were so different and I think what each chef was encouraged to do when they came up with their competition dish was to express themselves, connect with their own heritage and story. Um, so I suppose it only makes sense that everything will be quite individual. You're not going to get, you know, 10 chefs cooking the same dish. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. It's just like you can see where everyone is literally based or trained at. And I think that's really interesting too because, um, yeah, it literally shows you the whole history behind the chef itself. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to try all the dishes, but I could try a few and it was... I'm, I'm actually glad I wasn't, I wasn't in the judges' row, to be honest, because that would have been, for me, um, a real disaster because I think I wouldn't... I wouldn't have been able to make my mind up who who would be able to win or even even just to think to make such a decision afterwards because it was still the 10 best from the Pacific region, Pacific Asian region. So it's, it's a high level already. Yeah, well, I think the judges did find it excruciatingly difficult. So that's Josh Nyland, Peter Gilmore and Jackie Chalinor, all incredible chefs um, who bring their own context and story to cooking and, and to a competition such as this. And they did find it extremely close. Like it was very hard to pick a winner. And I think, you know, the message was... Um, was disseminated again and again through the competition and obviously you you feel it as well that really each chef is um, striving to do their best on their own terms and I think San Pellegrino and the Academy would be very pleased to hear you say that it was, you know, more about creating a community and um, and those and those great connections um, and, yeah, who knows where, where they will lead. Um, Robin... We need to talk about your dish. I was lucky enough to try nine out of the ten dishes. One just snuck past me. Um, but I loved your dish. Please go into detail and tell us about it. Yes, Norris, I will do. Um, yeah, from if you, if you can imagine visually the dish itself, it looks quite simple. So it's just getting plated in a deeper bowl and we're having a smoked celeric foam on the bottom, which is... So literally, it's just a normal celeric base, um, as you would usually cook a puree, pretty much, and then it gets emulsified with um, cold smoked oil, which we're smoking um, with hickory wood for 24 hours. Um, and then we're having 
crispy taro, which gets sliced in fine chiffonade, um, having also a braised celery, which is literally layered more like a milfeu and then gets baked in the oven. Yeah, I just say it more like a milfeu because everyone is expecting... Yeah, something baked or more like a terrine. It's just like hard to say because there's so many layers in between. So I just place, I go on a meat slicer when the celeric is, celeric is peeled and it just gets sliced very thinly, really fine. And you're placing and pressing all those layers on top of each other with a celeric and Granny Smith apple reduction. So I know it sounds really like, yeah, it's always celeric and apple and stuff, but these two components... Firstly, working so well together, and secondly, they're having the perfect amount of sugar and acidity, which gives me, in this case, the advantage that I really ha don't have to use any kind of, yeah, I don't have to add any sweeteners. So I'm just, my main attendance to create this dish was literally to use neither sugar or any animal products and also to keep it gluten-free so it's just like to have something which looks quite simple at the beginning but can become so complex just because of different kind of textures and temperatures um yeah which make it really work out luckily <laughs> it certainly did work out i thought your dish was extraordinary it was it did look quite restrained uh, as you say, just uh, some quite pale textures um, layered up in in a deep bowl uh, to create a dish with very with minimal ingredients, so celeriac, taro, and apple. I guess with similar tones, um, you did seem to find so many possibilities in those ingredients. Um, but tell me how you came up with this idea, you know, to do something vegan and at first blush quite simple seems extremely brave in a competition setting. Yeah, in this case, yeah, that's a really good topic. In this case, um, yeah, I have to say it's like since I'm at McGill and it's now four years pretty much, we're having always pop-up dietaries and we're having always – requests which um, most of the restaurants i think not even in australia also around the world having and the way to lead in, in plant-based dishes i think 11 medicine park made a really big step forward after the pandemic and it also noma in denmark um, was also going ahead with the seasonal and vegetable menu but for me it was more the main intendance that I'm really feeling joy in doing vegetable and vegan dishes there. It's just for me, it's, I'm, I'm a normal trained chef. So from my kind of perspective, I'm not, I'm not vegan or vegetarian at all. So for me to have this understanding when you go for dinner, for example, with your better half or with a friend and you, for example, don't like that kind of thing and you're just getting an, an option more like, let's call it a gap filler. Yeah, you still want to have this kind of dish memorable because you're still paying literally the same price for the experience or not. You're still going to a restaurant and still want to have something which starts to sneak into your mind and you can always remember it and want to think about it not the following day after or after a few naps. It's just like you want to have something which most of the time or at least the whole experience will stick in your mind that you always come back and then you're having always a very good yeah reminder what's going to be happen or what happened in the last couple of years i think it's like more like an anniversary or anything and um it's also like the thinking i don't like i don't like the hype for all those kind of ingredients like caviar for example or if you would have wagyu or anything i really like don't don't get me wrong. Yeah, I like those ingredients. I really love to work with. If not, I wouldn't have become a chef 15 years ago. So it's really the main intendance to think, why, what kind of value is this ingredient having in comparison to the other? Yeah, we're just talking pretty much about price. Yeah, when we're having, for example, a tin of caviar, 250 grams, costs around $650. And then having in comparison, having a celeric who cost $3.99 a kilo, and you're still able 
if you're having the right mindset and the right thinking behind it to make something memorable on the same level as an ingredient which is pretty much 20 times more expensive than the other. It's just like yeah. that kind of thinking which I would like to trigger because from that kind of perspective, a challenge is only a challenge if you accept it to yourself. And I did. I was lucky enough in McGill that I'm able to, that Scott gave me the opportunity and play, playground, as I already mentioned in the awards. And um, I think that's definitely just the surface which I start I'm scratching on. And I hope that I really can make sure to get it even further and even deeper because I think it's a really interesting topic. Absolutely. So interesting and, and so well articulated. I mean, as you're speaking, I feel like I'm hearing you say that all diners are worthy of respect and inclusion or the dishes that, that they that they eat. If they're vegan, let's say, for example, or if they're gluten-free, there should be as much intention and thought and respect given to those dishes. But I also hear an, an inclusivity or a wish for inclusivity with ingredients. Like why shouldn't the humble celeriac rank alongside caviar? Some of these decisions are really quite arbitrary in, in terms of which 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 ingredients or materials we consider uh, to have prestige. Yeah, it is not, is not. So I try to bring both on the same page. It doesn't mean that the opinion of a guest or a chef is still the same. It's just more like when you come in a restaurant and you're having a preference and you want to be a vegetarian, I think it doesn't mean just that you're getting pretty much fried fries just because you 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 having a different mindset than your partner it's more like you still so we at mcgill we really try to push the boundaries and it's always for we're having a vegetarian and we're having a vegan menu which is available for our guests doesn't matter if they pop up or not so we also the whole menu starts with at least seven snacks before this whole menu starts and we are all flexible to make it vegan or vegetarian so we we are really flexible in this case so most of the dietaries or requirements it's nothing nothing which concerns us you know i know you having a lot of experience as well in regards to kitchen and there's always most of the time is there's some chefs around they're having this mindset oh yeah mm, there's a dietary coming in oh yeah no i don't like this person anymore just for whatever kind of reason just because this person is having a different thinking and we're just we accepted it and we just pretty much said, yeah, there's always going to be stock in house and we're always making sure there are always ingredients, how we can accomplish the whole menu. It doesn't matter if it changes for a season or not. We are always able to do something for our guests. And I think that's definitely the right way because we are not a vegetarian or vegan restaurant. We are having also our ingredients, which we are proud of, especially in South Australia and our specifically because the hospitality here in Adelaide or in SA itself is not that hyped than in Melbourne or in NSW in Sydney. We are actually quite small in comparison to that. And I'm really happy that we got the price pretty much. And I'm really proud to be part in Milan and to represent the Pacific region as well on a really different way because they most likely will only know us for kangaroos and koala bears. And then it's just like, something um how we can tick the box robin when you go to milan next october with your assigned mentor peter gilmore to represent the pacific region do you cook the same dish or do you are you able to come up with another one mm, i think firstly it's really important also to hear peter gilmore's opinion in regards to that i think my mindset definitely won't change it gets more how would you say it gets more, I think it just gets placed in a better, better direction, I would guess. Um, I think for me, it's a really good way to stick on my thinking and yeah, my philosophy, which I have created in the last couple of years. So either, either we're having add-ons and making this whole dish in a different way, a little bit more, yeah, spectacular, 
or we just totally change it. But um, I won't say too much though. <laughs> I will also ask Peter for sure what he's thinking. And it's really important for me also to have his opinion because from that kind of view, um, yeah, I also have something to learn from him and I'm really, really happy that he's part of the mentorship for sure. Robin, what made you want to go in a competition and, and have you done lots of other competitions in the past? I think my wife will be, will be really happy that I'm saying that now. I hope so. I can hear her giggling already around the corner. So pretty much she was the person who said, yeah, try it. And yeah, I tried it. I applied for it and she was literally, yeah, he, she was really supportive. She just said, yeah, just give it a go. Um, I knew straight away what kind of dish I would serve or what kind of dish I would create because it's literally, yeah, St. Pellegrino Academy asked for a signature dish and that's, that's a real signature dish from my side. That's something which I have done and which conf yeah, was confirmed by Scott and which we already had on the menu. So it was really something which I could stay behind it. And, um, Yes, I competed in 2018 in a pastry competition in Sydney, ICC. That was for Saver School. And um, it didn't turn out well. It was, it, was not, it was not very good for me at this point. It was a few years back and it just didn't work out. I don't know why. I think I was too much chef based. I had too much chef thinking instead of a pastry chef thinking. I think that pretty much um, yeah, broke my neck, I would say. <laughs> what kind of mindset do you think is important to bring into a competitive scenario like this? I think it's important to be yourself. It just doesn't make sense to copy paste something or do something which everyone else has already tried or done. For sure, there are millions of options how you can combine ingredients and flavor together. But at a certain point, everyone is having a different history behind themselves and they're having a different background. Does it mean, yeah, it also means cultural ways. Like, yeah, if you're having, yeah, or well, if you're having a different memory or anything, I think it's really important to be yourself, as I said already. It does just, yeah, just be yourself. If not, what, what would you like to represent? Because at the end of the day, it's always, it's going to be your face and your name, which is going to be on the paper. And I think I would be more than happy to look back to that. And I could say, even if I would have failed, I could say, yeah, I tried it, but this is my way. I think this time in the competition was the first time that I was able to express my thinking and my way, how I have created it or I, I have done it because I never was able to. You never will be able to explain this whole story to a guest in front of, yeah, in the restaurant. How do you want to do that? Robin, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your background and what's led you to South Australia. Um, can you fill us in? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, literally... I started my career 15 years ago. I'm turning 30 next year. So I had pretty much, yeah, we, so my career started in Germany. I started pretty much, I had my first apprenticeship or my first trial with 14. And then um, I had to do another apprentice year pretty much because I was too young. The hospitality law got changed in Germany. So you weren't able anymore to start your apprenticeship before the eight before the age of 18, um, which was a little bit difficult because in this case, we always did a lot of hours. So it was very difficult because no one literally wanted to send you home at nine or 10 o'clock at night because there was still stuff to do for the next three to four hours. And um, yeah, I had a few changes in between because it never worked out for me very well. And I got the opportunity um, from a chef in Frankfurt who started creating a cuisine which was unique to this time it was around 2012 where he decided to go only regional and seasonal produce but 100 to 150 kilometers around the restaurant so imagine you're living in a city like frankfurt it was frankfurt to this time and it's quite huge as well 
but there's not much going on around. So we had a few farmers and we had a few locals, but for him it was really important to start preserving, to think literally months ahead. And we had a big cellar where we had preserved roots. Um, we had elderberries, we had elderflowers, we had Jerusalem artichoke, flowers, roots, um, parsley, everything. Most of his stuff was either pickled or was um, preserved in sugar, vinegar, or whatever you want to imagine. It was just insane. And then so it kept going to take over all those kind of ingredients for the next yeah couple of years and years. And you started re reusing the oil, um, which you had, for example, in the jar for one and a half years already, and you just use it for another route. I know it sounds a little bit disgusting, but if you think how the how the infusion, it was literally like a cold infusion. It was like a wine cellar. So the start starts ripening and preserving down there and you could use it for a following dish again and again. And you had always a story behind it. It was just amazing. And then I had the opportunity after my apprenticeship to work in a three Michelin star for, oh yeah, for three years. And that's where I literally got my thinking about how to start thinking and how to create a dish because my pastry chef to this time he was just he was just insane he was like he picked one fruit or vegetable from the season and he literally took that as a base and then he was reading through he read articles he read books what kind of terrain was the peach literally growing on? What kind of steepness, hill, etc.? Do we have micro season in between? Um, are we also able to use not only the fruit itself, also the knosps, um, the flowers, the bark of the tree? And that's how everything started. And I'm really glad that I was able to join this because it really, yeah, it pretty much, yeah, it showed me how how flexible and how creative you can be and it really worked out well. Wow, you started with such amazing mentors and in such incredible scenarios. Um, what happened next What and how did you end up over here? Yeah, over here was literally like we had, yeah, I had two options. I got I got a trial in the library in London and um, I'm not even sure if I shouldn't mention that, but it was a disaster. Uh, it was the first time after probably eight years in German school that I had English before, and it was a nightmare. I couldn't deal with the UK accent. It was was just, I was over. Uh, this first trial there was a disaster for me, to be honest. Yeah, it was just like, I couldn't deal with the accent and everything. Then, um, yeah, I got a job offer from CPA in Sydney for a working holiday, and that's what we took in 2017. And that's just the whole journey started. I went to Lake House in Delsford, Alla Wolf Tasca for one year. And then I got the job opportunity in McGill Estate Restaurant. And um, yeah, that's why I am. <laughs> I'm so, um, I find it so interesting that the Australian accent worked out better for you than the English accent. <laughs> yeah, it really did. Actually, Brad Graham to this time told me, you're going to struggle if I'm going to be down there. Because he he's Australian based, so he knew what he was talking. But I really appreciated the Australian accent more than the UK. But I'm also having friends now here. They're based from the UK, but I can understand them now very well. So everything is sorted out perfectly. <laughs> it's really funny. I suppose there are a lot of different UK accents to get your head around all at once. Whereas I suppose even though there are some regional variations in Australia, and I think particularly South Australia is often discernible, there's not as much difference in the accent um, or the classic Aussie accent. I guess there's a lot of people who are speaking English here from all kinds of different places. No, but it's really gentle down here. I'm glad for that. It's really interesting. I think it's it sort of says how important communication is in the kitchen. Yeah, I think it's always good to have really good connection, especially because hospitality is quite small and everyone is talking. So it's always good to have a backup plan and having a door where you can go to and having a really good relationship. Amazing. So you're working with Scott Huggins at McGill Estate and obviously you're finding 
you know him a, a really great mentor. You brought him with you to Sydney, and he was alongside you while you you cooked your dish for the uh, a competition. Where do you see things going, Robin? What are your plans? My plans. Oh, that's a really good question. So, um. Yeah, surely everyone is having the dream for opening his own restaurant. And I'm, yeah, I'm turning 30 soon. So I would appreciate if, if I would be able to get the opportunity in the next couple of years maybe to open my own business. It's not easy. It's also for sure a financial aspect. And also, yeah, we had this kind of thinking already with my wife because um, with the pandemic, it's just like, yeah, how would it turn out if it would happen again? Um yeah, it's also as a sous chef, I'm working as a sous chef for the last four years, which is a really good opportunity, but I'm also always looking forward to other opportunities, to be honest, because um, I won't I won't ever stay at McGill Estate. It's not like Scott Huggins is my mentor and he's owning it and he took over this business and he's leading it very well and he's having high expectations which i really appreciate which pushed me forward over the last four years and brought me there where i am at the moment but at a certain point i also i think i have to let go even if it's really hard for me um so yeah but i don't know what's gonna happen next it's just it's a really exciting moment at the moment um, and I'm really appreciating it. It's a lot going on and, yeah, I'm still just enjoying it. <laughs> That's, yeah, fantastic. Robin, what did it feel like when your name was announced as the winner? <laughs> Firstly, I actually couldn't believe it. Maybe it was a spelling mistake, I thought. <laughs> no, um, no, it was amazing. It was an unbelievable feeling. Um, to be honest, I haven't expected it. But it got confirmed and, um, yeah, I take the challenge. I love to grow so, and I really want to grow. So I think it's a really good opportunity for me to go to Milan and pushing boundaries. Love it. Well, it's um, absolutely a thrill to speak to you today and I can't wait to watch your star rise. I think you're a wonderful ambassador for Australia um, over in Italy. Uh, so, yeah, good on your wife for putting you forward um, and well done to you for really expressing yourself and, and telling a story in the dish. Thank you very much. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.